for everybody to join before we get started. Um, but I think it's consolidating. Um, all right, so um, welcome to this week's um, VSAT. Um, we are very happy to have Christoph Wolf, who is going to present um, a quest for knowledge, um, which is joined with Johannes Schneider, who's also here and um, will uh, help out with questions in the chat. So if you have any questions during the talk, uh, please feel free to use the chat. Um, and um, also, um, we are very happy to have um, two panelists. We have Florian Edera and Steve Callender. Um, and um, the talk is one hour with the 15 minute Q&A. So like I said, during the talk, um, you can ask questions in the chat and in the Q&A afterwards, you can also ask questions in person. And um, yeah, finally, we do this every week. So um, let me give you a preview to next week. We have Jan Ugun, with, um, who's going to present Collective Progress Dynamics of Exit Waves. Um, and yeah, and also finally, let me remind everybody that this talk is recorded. Um, all right, Christoph, so uh, you can go. Okay, thank you, Julia. Um, thank you for inviting us to present this paper and thank you everyone for being here. So as Julia mentioned, uh, this is joint work with Johannes and he also told me that he's happy to answer any questions in the chat. And um, so this is a paper as the title suggests about knowledge creation and in particular about knowledge creation through research. So the paper is motivated by basically two important points that have been raised by Vannevar Bush in his famous 1945 letter to Roosevelt, which eventually led to the creation of the National Science Foundation in the US. And these two points are that first of all, scientific progress is important for uh, societies. And second of all, that it's important for basic research that researchers act under scientific freedom. So under these two kind of premises of research, we want to build a framework to answer several natural questions about research and scientific progress. So first of all, we want to build a model in which we can, um, can analyze how researchers actually act under scientific freedom. And with such a description of their behavior at hand, we want to ask what the implications are for the evolution of knowledge. And then if there may be an interest in kind of altering the researcher's choices, how a funding institution can actually achieve desired um, um, behavior changes of researchers. So the model that we're going to propose has three main features. So first of all, the existing knowledge that researchers use in their work determines both the benefit of research and the cost that researchers incur when conducting research. Second, successful research is valuable because it improves conjectures about similar questions. And third, researchers are free to choose which questions they want to study and how hard they, want to, uh, how hard they work on trying to answer these questions. And the way we conceptualize um, the research process is by assuming that researchers basically do two things. The first thing they do is they select one research question out of many potential research questions that have correlated answers. And that condition on having chosen a research question, they costly search for an answer in which they're guided by the existing knowledge. And the value from research to society comes from additional knowledge improving the conjectures that society has about optimal policies. And what we show inside our framework is that two typical variables of research are endogenously linked. So the novelty of a research question is in this model uh, directly linked to the probability of discovering its answer. And then based on this, what we show is that actually expanding the knowledge frontier, so pushing what we know to new territories, 
is only then more desirable than deepening the existing knowledge inside the known frontiers if the area inside the frontiers is already sufficiently well understood. And what I mean by this, I guess, will become more clear later on. And then once we have this characterization at hand, we apply, we apply it to two classical questions in the economics of science. The first one is, as I mentioned before, the evolution of knowledge. And we show that there is a dynamic externality in the knowledge creation. That is, um, researchers do not take into account when choosing their actions today, how whatever they are going to find will affect um, the choices of future researchers. And then we can show that it can be optimal to incentivize excessive novelty, now excessive in, uh, from a short-term perspective, to actually improve the evolution of knowledge. Now, given that we know that maybe society has an incentive to affect the researcher's choices, we ask the question, which are the choices that a budget-constrained funder can actually implement? And towards this, we derive an implementable set of combinations of the novelty of a research question and output, which is what we call the probability of discovering answers. So our paper relates uh, to two basic strands of literature. The first one is, um, is the huge literature on the science of science, which has surprisingly few theoretical papers and kind of a large body of empirical literature that, um, that looks at different aspects of, um, of the research process. But in the interest of time, I will be quick here. And, and again, I can direct any questions um, about particular papers to, to Johannes in the chat. And on a conceptual level, um, we relate to the papers that uh, study um, the discovering a Brownian path. And inside this literature, two papers are very closely related. The first one by Kalender and Clark, and the second one by Prendergast. So in Kalender and Clark, the authors study um, um, it, very different applications. So they study an application in law and economics. And we differ in, besides the application in two regards. The first one is that um, in our case, the, the discovery process, so finding an answer to a question is actually um, not deterministic. So it's determined by um, the search of an agent for the answer, which may also fail. And second, um, the objective of, of the agents are very different. So this, this also drives a difference in the results. Close and Spirit is the Prendergast 2019 paper but um, there, there's also a difference. Um, it's, it's, it's very related in that it uh, studies kind of answering questions, um, which consists of finding an answer um, or finding a realization of a Brownian path. But he focuses, and that's why we view it complementary to our paper, on an agency problem. So in his paper, the principal wants to encourage an agent to answer a particular question. While in our paper, we are looking at the researcher freely choosing which question to answer. And the second difference is that the Prendergast paper restricts the set of potential questions that can be asked to a, to a given interval. Whereas you will see that in our model, a researcher can choose from many different potential research areas and can also expand kind of the intervals that, um, that researchers can choose from. So in that case, um, the Prendergast paper, if you would restrict, rest, um, would abstract from uh, the agency problem, can be a special case of our problem, while you could also try to um, look at an agency problem now. So neither nests the other here. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the plan of the presentation. So we eventually want to talk about the researcher's problem. But towards this, we will need quite some time. So, so I ask you to, to bear with me for a little bit until we get to the actual description of the researcher's problem, because I will first introduce you to, to our model of knowledge and how we think about knowledge. And then based on this uh, model, we will step-by-step step, uh, characterize the researcher's objective. So we will first um, compute the benefit of a discovery 
And then we will describe the search process of the researcher from which we derive the cost function of research. And then we put everything together and characterize the researcher's optimal choices, which we then use to study the applications I've mentioned before. So let's begin with the model of knowledge and I will first introduce the model formally, but then afterwards I will show what everything means graphically, which is uh, probably much so. So we think about every potential research question to be on the real line. So every number on the real line is a question that you can ask and every question has an answer. And the answer to question X, we denote by Y of X, and that's a realization of a random variable, which is also on the real line. Now, the truth, which is the realization of all answers, is given by the realization of a standard Brownian motion over the entire real line. And then what we call knowledge is the set of points that we already know. So it's the set of all the questions um, x1 to xk, to which we know the answers y of x1, y of xk, and so on. And to, to make notation easier, we assume that um, the questions in knowledge are ordered by their position on the real line. So x1 is the leftmost questions, question to which we know the answer, and xk is the rightmost question to which we know the answer. Then what knowledge does is it partitions questions into different research areas. So going from minus infinity to X1, we have the first research area. Then X1 to X2 is the second research area and so on until research area K, which goes from the rightmost question to which we know the answer until infinity. And it will later on be useful to give a name to the length of a research area. So the length of a research area is simply the upper bound of the interval minus the lower bound. So area zero and area K have a length infinity and all the others have according length. Now, what we will use a lot is what we call conjectures. And we call a conjecture, the distribution of the answer Y of X to a particular question X. And we denote this by GX. Now, given that, the, that a Brownian path determines the answer, we know that the distribution of all random variables, so all answers, is normal with a mean and a variance. And again, this Brownian motion buys us a lot of tractability here so that we can directly compute the mean and the variance of these random variables using the existing knowledge. So, for all the questions that lie to the left of the leftmost point, the answer has an expected value that's equal to the answer to question X1. And similarly, for all questions, the right of the rightmost question to which we know the answer. And for all questions that lie in an interior research area, so between two questions to which we already know the answers, um, we can form a Brownian bridge. And I will show you graphically then how that looks like. And similarly, the variance is very easy. Um, for all the questions to the left, the leftmost known point, the variance is just given by the distance of the question X we're considering to this leftmost point. Similarly, for all questions to the right of the rightmost uh, question, the variance is given by the distance to this closest known uh, question. And in between, the variance is actually a concave function. And um, again, we will see a graph of this. So the way we're thinking about this model is now that on the horizontal axis, we have all questions that you can think about. On the vertical axis, we have all the answers. And now this gray, gray line is one example of a realization of a Brownian motion. So this line tells us where all the answers to all questions lie. So the red dot in the middle is now the only question to which we know the answer. And in this example, the question is question zero and the answer to this question is 42. Now, how do we form the conjectures here? So 
The conjectures in this case are such that for all questions to the left, the expected answer is going to be 42. And for all questions to the right, the answer is 42 as well. So the solid line depicts the expected answers. Now, the dashed lines represent uh, prediction intervals. That means that we expect the answer to question, say, minus one to lie in between this interval given by the dashed lines with a probability of, um, of 95%. Okay, so as you can see, this dashed lines get further and further apart. So um, the conjectures become less and less precise the further we move away from existing norms. Now, what research does in our model is it adds additional answers to questions. So in this example, we have answered a question minus 1.2, which is roughly 46.5. Now, what happens is that everything to the right of the point zero is unaffected. So this additional question does not provide additional information to the questions that lie to the right of question zero but it actually provides information to all the questions to the left of the new question which we've answered. And in particular, it's the same as before. These are all questions to the left of the leftmost known point. So their expected answer is equal to the answer to the question minus 1.2 over here. But what happens in between the two knowledge points is that we build a Brownian bridge in between. So the expected answers lie on the straight line that connects these two points of knowledge here. And the, um, the, the prediction intervals are now more narrow because when forming the conjectures, you're using information not from one point only, but from two points. Okay. So when trying to answer the question now minus 0 0.5, you know the realization to question zero, but also the realization to question minus 1.2. So now you have more information than you actually had before. You can do the same thing on the right side. You can add the point of knowledge on the right side here, which is answering question 1.2. But something else that you can do is you can not only expand the knowledge frontier, so move the rightmost point further to the right or the leftmost point further to the left. You can also what we call deepen knowledge, that is move inside the research area, which was given now by the question zero to question 1.2, and now answer a question in between. So answer a question, say, 0 0.9 here. This again creates now two research areas, which are given by between 0 and 0 0.9, and 0 0.9 and 1.2. And now we have two Brownian bridges here with even more precise conjectures than those that we had before. So this describes our model of knowledge up to this point. Um, what we're going to do next is we want to describe what the value of knowledge is to society. And towards this, we um, represent society by a single decision maker that observes the existing knowledge FK and uses this knowledge to make policy decisions. And we're making a simplifying assumption here and we assume that society has to take decisions on all questions. So in every question X and R, society has to make a choice. Um, this would be easily relaxed conceptually, and you could think about uh, questions being randomly drawn, but, um, but uh, um, this would come at kind of a loss of tractability. And so for now to focus on our basic points, we try to, to keep everything as simple as possible. Now, what society can do when uh, addressing a particular question X, society can either decide to make a proactive choice that is guessing kind of the optimal answer, the true answer to the question. So proactive choice is a number A on the real line, or society can refrain from taking a proactive choice and stick with the status quo action. So we think about this doing nothing as kind of a safe option that prevents us to take very risky choices. So the associated payoffs of these actions are as follows. For any proactive choice, the payoff to society is kind of a simple transformation of a quadratic loss function. So 
society gets one minus the quadratic loss from the action A if the actual answer is Y of X. And we scale this by a parameter Q. So that means that whenever society um, knows that the answer Y of X, it would get a payoff of one. And whenever it doesn't hit exactly Y of X, you get one minus the scaled quadratic loss. Now, the status quo action always secures society a safe payoff of zero. And um, as I said, we think of this as kind of some, some, some safe action that society can, can take. Um, so, so this is more a model of issues that are not very pressing. Okay, so, so it's not that society has to address a particular issue now, it could just postpone it to the future and do nothing for now. Now about this, um, this uh, scaling parameter Q, this parameter Q kind of measures the error tolerance of society. So society prefers a proactive choice, not only when it precisely knows the answer, it also prefers a proactive choice if it's not too far away from the true answer. So if society is only square root of Q away from the true answer, then um, society is still indifferent between this proactive choice and the status quo action. So whenever you're even closer, you strictly prefer the proactive choice. Okay. Now with this model so far, we can now compute what the benefit of the discovery is. And so how do we think about this benefit of a discovery and the value of knowledge? So there's this famous quote by, by Marshak who said that knowledge is useful if it helps to take the best decisions. And there's been a recent AER paper that actually shows that um, science fosters the uh, adoption of effective policies and that providing even more precise information improves these policies further. And this is basically what's going on in our model too. So with this simple payoff function that I've just shown to you, um, uh, you can easily compute the optimal action of society. Now the optimal action of society is a proactive choice, which is equal to the expected answer if society's conjecture is sufficiently precise. So society is only going to make a proactive choice if the variance of the, uh, of the conjecture is, is um, below Q. If the variance is higher, society um, rather refrains from taking an action and sticks with the status quo option because it would be too risky to take a proactive choice here. Now, the benefit then from knowledge comes from improving these conjectures about optimal policies. And what we then define as the value of knowledge is the value that society generates for making some uh, proactive choices that society is able to take because it knows a particular set of answers to questions. So we aggregate the per question payoff under the optimal action over all questions which society addresses. This is our value of knowledge. And with this value at hand, we can now compute the benefit of a new discovery. The benefit of a or so first of all, what a discovery does is a discovery adds a new question and answer pair to existing knowledge. That means that if knowledge before was FK, now knowledge is FK, and in addition, this new um, answered question. So the benefit of this discovery then is the improvement in society's decision-making. So the value of discovering the answer to question X, if you knew FK before, is the value of the new knowledge minus the value of the old knowledge. Now, just a little bit of, of language at this point. So recall that question X1 was the leftmost question that we knew and question xk, the rightmost question that we knew before, then x1 and xk are what we call the frontiers of knowledge. And we call a, a discovery that is not inside this frontier to be expanding knowledge, and those questions that are inside the frontier, we call it to deepen knowledge. 
And just off, can I ask? I think it just helped me a little at this point uh, to sort of firm up the application or the connection uh, that you're making here. So, can I think of this as sort of my as an academic, my sort of understanding of a field? My value of a field is how well I understand that field, or how confident I am we know the answers to how auctions work in practice, or something like that. And so payoff function you have, I can interpret as sort of, I feel like we understand an area if my variance is less than Q or root Q. Right. And so, so if, if somebody writes a paper that sort of helps me understand a set of questions, I yeah. assign value given by how much they reduce that variance uh, in my belief with this threshold of Q. Right, so so this is so far the, only the, the value to society, so the research is not here yet, and really the value of knowledge to society comes from informing you about, um, about the answers to particular questions, mm -hmm. and because you know more about the answers to particular questions, you can adjust your policies better to it. So for a long time, uh, many policymakers didn't care about climate change because that was not particularly well understood. So they chose their status quo option of doing nothing. But then more and more scientific evidence came in. Policymakers became more certain that this is a problem. So they started addressing it proactively. And then by refining knowledge more and more, the policies could become better and better. That's the idea here. Christoph, the, the, Johannes is doing a great job answering all the questions in chat, but maybe let me like bring up, oh, he answered just the one I was going to bring up, which is just implicitly assuming here that everything has equal value in terms of questions. Exactly. So there's, there's nothing that where we say have a more pressing or less pressing need versus, you know. Yes, perfect. Well, that's that's a very important point. Um, we're, we're assuming away anything that's, that's very urgent. So we're not thinking about kind of finding a cure for COVID right now. So this is maybe our most important question. This is really in a paper on, on less pressing issues. And it would, be, it would be straightforward to incorporate a weighting on particular uh, questions, but, but this would come at a huge cost of, of tractability. So, so we abstract away from this for now. So all questions are weighted equally. Okay. So that was a good moment to pause because now I will do a slight change of variables that will make things a little bit easier. So we will stop um, keeping track of the precise question that we are asking. So what will be relevant from now on is not the question itself, but the distance of the question to existing knowledge. And the distance of a question to existing knowledge is really just the simple Euclidean distance of a question X to um, the closest point inside existing knowledge. That's what we call the distance. And the second variable, which I mentioned before, that we are going to keep track of is the length of the research area in which the question X lies. So remember, they can either lie on one of the frontiers, in which case the, the length of the research area is infinity, or inside a given frontier. And there, the length of the research area is just upper bound minus lower bound. And this allows us then to write the variance of our conjecture very simply as just the distance times x minus the distance, clear what this, this exactly is, divided by the area length. In the limit of expanding knowledge, this distance will actually be a linear, uh, this variance will be a linear function of the distance. Again, this is not super important right now. I will remind you at which points this will become relevant. But now we can describe the benefit of a discovery only in terms of these two variables, in terms of the distance to existing knowledge and the length of the research area. And what we can do then is with all the, the ingredients that we have so far, we can uh, just simply calculate um, this value of, um, of a new discovery, which gives us an, an ugly formula. And so it might be easier to look at this graphic. So this graph here has on the horizontal axis, the set of potential questions, the set of questions. And on the vertical axis, we have the variance of the conjecture to this question. 
So now suppose that we start by knowing only the answer to question zero. In this case, our value of knowledge is proportional to this orange area because all questions that lie to the left of the question minus Q have so imprecise conjectures that society sticks with the status quo action. So the payoff is zero on those to the right of question Q is the same, but in between, so between question minus Q and question Q, society makes proactive choices and the benefit to society of these proactive choices is then proportional to this length from Q, the dashed line to the variance. Now, what happens when we discover uh, the answer to a new question? Well, we shift the leftmost point now from zero to minus two Q. And the first thing that you should see is that nothing changes to the right of the rightmost point and to the left of the leftmost point. So this yellow area um, remains there. But the value that we gain from this new point is actually the green area. We've now created a research area between minus two Q and zero, which has relatively precise conjectures so that society takes proactive choices. So the benefit of this discovery is this green area. Now, the question now is which distance to existing knowledge maximizes this benefit? And this is easily, or, or, or yeah, is described by a marginal, inframarginal trade off as for, for monopoly pricing. So suppose society considers um, a slightly higher distance to existing knowledge. So answering question 3Q now, what happens is now that we have more questions to which we have imp uh, improved conjectures. Instead of going until 2Q, we are now going to 3Q. That's the marginal gain, that we have additional questions which we address proactively. But there's an inframarginal loss on the questions that we had before, because now these conjectures are less precise. And you can show that um, for, for small distances, the marginal loss outweighs, sorry, the marginal gain outweighs the inframarginal loss, but you cannot go too far. Eventually the inframarginal loss overtakes the marginal gain. Okay, and so what we can show is that the optimal distance of expanding knowledge, now optimal in the sense of maximizing the benefit of discovery is equal to three Q. Now that was for expanding knowledge. Remember, we also said that we can deepen knowledge. So suppose we have a research area where we know the answer to question zero and that we know the answer to question minus six Q. So that means that our initial value is this yellow area, but now we want to, to find a new answer. So first of all, what deepening knowledge does is it breaks up this long research area into two shorter research areas. So one research area from minus 6Q to minus 3Q and one from minus 3Q to zero. And now both these research areas have more precise conjectures than the large research area had before. And in particular, we saw on the previous slide that the largest value of a research area actually happens when the length of the area is 3Q. So if you have precisely such an interval, the best thing you can do is you jump on the midpoint of this research area and create two areas now with very precise conjectures. However, this will not always be optimal. So if you have a larger research area to start with, now this research area here has a length of 8Q, you could again jump on the midpoint. But now what happens when you do this is that now you have two research areas, but with relatively imprecise conjectures. What's better in this case is to focus on one research area with precise conjectures and give up a little bit on the other research area. And again, you have a gain in one research area, the shorter one, and a loss in the other research area. And actually we can show that if this area is large enough, such a gain will outweigh the loss. And the reason is precisely the existence of the status quo action, because the loss is bounded in this case, because Although you now have an area with very imprecise conjectures, society will just stop taking actions on some question because the conjectures are too imprecise. And this kind of cushions the loss that you would otherwise have by creating an area with, um, with imprecise conjectures. Okay. 
So to summarize, what we can say is that um, on the expanding knowledge interval, the optimal distance is 3Q. On short research areas, when deepening knowledge, you want to jump on the midpoint. And on large research areas, you go somewhere between 3Q and the midpoint of the interval. Uh, Christoph, let me stop you right there because I think Ada asked an important question, which is sort of what is the time horizon here for all of these choices? Um, and he raises this point of saying like, sure, it's true that you have this trade-off here, but it doesn't take into account all the choices that you might be making following that initial thing. Can you just make sure and clarify exactly the point of the time horizon here? Perfect. So up to this point, we are living in a purely static world. The existing knowledge comes from somewhere. There's one researcher or, or society just answering one question and then um, the world stops. Okay, so we are really here in a one period world. I will show you the extension to a more dynamic um, version with endogenous creation of existing knowledge later on. But for now, we're purely myopic. So thanks for, for the question, it's good. And, and just to follow up on that. So the, the third bullet point, it's, it's an argument for incrementalism. You don't, what's interesting about it is you don't have a cost of experimenting or asking a bold question. It's, yes. There's no cost here, but you're still generating this sort of incrementalism endogenously by this single researcher. And so to sort of follow on Florian's questions, this might right. be something, this is going to cause a long run cost. And so this is something we might want to correct as a designer. Exactly. So, so I, I guess uh, we should we should hold on with the dynamic discussion for a little bit. But let me just foreshadow: it will not be optimal to go just very very far away, even if that is costly, because you when you when you go into a research area and you go very far from existing knowledge, you do improve some conjectures. But again, the large part of the conjectures will still be so imprecise that this improvement is not so valuable. So really the goal is, is to, to improve as many conjectures as good as, as much as possible. But given that this, these conjectures get less and less precise, the further you move out, um, you never want to go too far away. So this is where this is coming from. It's kind of reminiscent of these islands of knowledge that people talk about. Okay. So um, then this benefit of discovery function um, is, uh, is easily described graphically, okay? Now, as a function of the area length, we compute the benefit of the benefit maximizing um, distance to existing knowledge. So the solid line represents the benefit that, that comes from discovering the, um, the benefit maximizing uh, answer. And um, it's given by this particular value. And the dashed line is the benefit of discovering the best question in a, in, a, in a research area of length x. So clearly, short research areas do not provide um, a lot of additional value because in short research areas, we already have very precise conjectures. So making them even more precise does not provide much value. However, as the research area gets larger, um, the value increases and then overtakes the benefit of expanding knowledge and then has some interior maximum converges to the benefit of expanding knowledge. Good. So this uh, concludes this benefit of discovery function. Now let me introduce you to our cost of research. So the way we are conceptualizing research is that we assume that a researcher who decided on trying to answer question X, searches for the answer to question X by sampling an interval um, AB. So remember now, a question is the point on the horizontal axis and the answer is somewhere on the vertical real line. Now the researcher decides on an interval on the vertical um, axis, which he wants to sample for the answer. And we say that the researcher discovers the answer to this question only if the answer actually lies inside of the interval that the researcher samples. And then we assume that the search for an answer is costly and um, the particular functional form we assume here is that it's um, the square of the length of the interval multiplied by just some parameter eta. 
Okay, so the particular functional form is not very important, as you will see in a second, but again, this buys us a lot of tractability here. Now, what we can show, and this follows more or less directly from the normal distribution that comes out of our Brownian assumptions, that if a researcher selects a question X that has distance D to existing knowledge in a research area of length X, then the lowest cost search interval, so the shortest search interval, such that the answer to that question is contained inside this interval with a certain probability rho has this length here. So this length here is just um, a parameter, um, um, a parameter multiplied by the inverse of the error function of rho of the probability that with which we want the answer to lie in this interval multiplied by the standard deviation of our conjecture here, okay? Now, again, this is just the property of kind of the, the um, prediction intervals of the normal distribution. And then applying our cost function, so squaring all the terms, we get that it's eta times h times the square of the inverse error function times the variance of our conjecture, okay? And so, here, what's going to be very convenient for us is that this cost function is multiplicatively separable in the probability with which we want to find the answer and the precision of the conjectures about the, about the answer. So importantly, this is where the link between the probability of finding an answer and the distance to existing knowledge and novelty come in. So the selection of the question here really matters for our cost of discovering the answer. Because the distance to existing knowledge tells us um, how well we already, uh, how much we already know about this question. So the more precise my conjecture about the answer is, the better I know where to search for the answer. So now we finally all the ingredients together to study the researcher's problem. And the way we think about research here is again following a quote by Peter Melava, who says that re research is surely the art of the soluble. Good scientists study the most important problems they think they can solve. So how do we model the researcher here? So we assume that a short-lived researcher here, again, we're still in a static world, arrives and observes the existing knowledge FK. Then observe, upon observing FK, he contemplates his payoffs. And what we're assuming here is that there's sort of a, a perfect market um, for science in the sense that the payoff a researcher gets when making a discovery is exactly equal to the value that, um, that society gets from this discovery. Okay, we're not having any frictions in here that researchers uh, prefer a particular kind of finding or anything like that. We just assume that the benefit of a discovery for the researcher is equal to the benefit that um, society gets from this discovery. And then of course, the researcher bears the cost of the search for the answer. So the choices of the researcher are then which question to study and the search interval um, of the researcher. And again, we can do a little bit of rewriting to make the problem simpler. So this choice of question X and of the search interval, we can, um, we can rewrite into a choice of a research area, which we just denote by the length of the research area X, a distance to existing knowledge D as before, and a success probability of search row. And then the researcher's payoffs are the probability of finding an answer times the benefit of finding this particular answer, minus the cost of research. So importantly, here's also an implicit assumption that a researcher only gets a payoff if she actually discovers something. So there's no benefits of null results here. And that's actually a very interesting question that we're sort of working on right now. But for this baseline model, only a payoff is, um, is guaranteed for finding an answer. And now we go over this maximization problem step by step. So we're first going to look at the researcher's choice in a given research interval. So an optimal choice of distance to existing knowledge 
and success probability. And then we're going to look at the optimal choice of research area. So what we can characterize in the first step is whether output, that is the success probability of research and distance to existing knowledge are actually substitutes or complements. That is, if I try to answer a more novel question, am I going to do this with a higher probability of success or a lower probability of success? And it turns out that this answer is non-trivial. Whenever the researcher tries to expand knowledge, then actually the two are substitutes, as you might expect. The further you move away from existing knowledge, the lower will be the, uh, the probability of success growth. However, when the researcher deepens knowledge, then whether the distance and the success probability are complements or substitutes depends on the research area. So the two will be independent if the research area is short. And when the research area is of intermediate length, then a distance and success probability are going to be complements. For slightly larger intervals, they will be substitutes for short distances and complements for longer distances. And if the research interval is very large, they are going to be substitutes again, as in the case of expanding knowledge. So what's the intuition for this? So you have to remember that now due to our cost function, an increase in novelty affects not only the marginal benefit of increasing the success probability, it also affects the marginal cost. And the reason is that if you want to find the answer with a particular probability rho, and you have a more and more imprecise conjecture, you will have to sample a larger and larger interval. So there's an effect on both the marginal benefit, the marginal cost, and it follows that um, the success probability and novelty are complements only if the increase in the marginal benefit, the relative increase in the marginal benefit is larger than the relative increase in the, um, the variance of the conjecture. Now, what, what you should now, now keep in mind is that first of all, whenever you increase novelty, you will have more and more imprecise conjectures. So this should push us always when the area length grows towards um, the two becoming substitutes. However, what happens with the benefit of a discovery um, when we increase novelty? So first of all, for short research areas, the benefit we can show is proportional to the variance so the two are independent. Now, if we instead increase the research area just beyond 4Q, then this increase in the benefit of a discovery accelerates. And so why does this happen? And why is 4Q relevant? So the 4Q is relevant because when the, the length of the research area um, exceeds 4Q, what's happening is that the society before did not address some questions proactively because the conjectures were not precise enough. So now if I answer a question um, now in such a research area, the value grows a lot because now we're addressing some questions that we didn't address before. And this actually makes the, the marginal benefit effect overtake um, the marginal cost effect. So therefore distance and success probability become complements because now I have access to answering questions that will be very valuable for society. So I'm willing to also pay a higher cost um, um, to get a higher probability of success. However, as X, so the area length increases further, this marginal cost effect starts dominating, but it starts dominating only for small distances because for small distances, this increase in the imprecision is very large. And this makes distance and success probability um, substitutes. Now, what's more interesting is that if the chosen distance gets closer and closer to the midpoint of the interval, then the marginal cost effect actually goes to zero. That means that um, uh, distance and success probability become complements again. And now the reason for this to happen is that if you move closer and closer to the midpoint of the interval, the, um, the, um, the variance is concave. 
because if you increase the distance to existing knowledge, at the same time, you're moving closer to the other boundary of the research area you're considering. So the loss of moving away from existing knowledge becomes smaller and smaller because now you're just very close to the other um, point of knowledge as well. So therefore then any increases in distance when they still increase the value of the discovery will come together with an increase in the success probability. And now finally, if the distance you're considering is so large that the benefit of discovery is just decreasing in novelty, then clearly distance and uh, success probability will be substitutes. Now this describes- uh, Very sorry. quick heads up for the 10 minutes. Yes, perfect, thank you. So this, this describes our choices of the researcher inside an interval. Now we can also look at the choice of researchers um, between research areas. And I'm going to do this graphically now as well. So here we have the different research areas on the horizontal axis and the researcher's optimal payoff inside such a research area on the vertical axis. And what you can see is that um, expanding knowledge dominates deepening knowledge on short research areas. But once research areas become larger, deepening knowledge is always going to be better than expanding knowledge. And researchers actually prefer some intermediate length research areas. And similarly, the optimal novelty in research areas and the output, as I will show you in a second, are non-monotone in the area length. And um, the highest degrees of novelty are also obtained for intermediate research areas and the highest output is also obtained for um, intermediate research areas. And so this is our description of the researcher's choices. You can characterize more and more, but let's summarize the interesting takeaways here. So the interesting takeaways in our opinion are first of all, that output and novelty are here really endogenously linked in two ways, uh, or basically in one way, through the cost of research that comes um, from the researcher being guided by existing knowledge. And actually they can be both substitutes and complements. Now second, this existing knowledge that the researcher builds on determines the choice of the researcher's um, research area and novelty and output. In particular, research areas of intermediate length come with the highest novelty and highest output. Okay. And so this suggests that there should be a dynamic externality as, as many of you now already mentioned, which comes from the fact that if researchers are short-lived and do not take any long run effects into account, they do not um, take into account that the benefit, the discovery today will affect the choices and also the success probabilities in the future. In this observation, we then take uh, to an application. And in particular, we ask the question whether it is beneficial to a long-lived society to incentivize very novel research, so moonshots. So with very novel, we mean uh, discoveries that are more than myopically optimal. And we look at the simplest kind of model that we can think of, and this is a discrete time model where we start with just one known question answer pair and society discounting time by Delta. And society faces a sequence of short-lived researchers that always observe the existing knowledge in period two and then decide on their research question and the success probability of research. Again, to simplify everything, we assume symmetric strategies. That is, if you observe the same um, um, knowledge, you're also going to choose the same um, research question and success probability that comes at some loss, but we discuss in the paper that it does not come at a loss of insight. Now, whenever a researcher is successful, um, then knowledge updates. So the knowledge in the next period is the knowledge we had before plus the additional discovery. And if research is not successful, um, the set of knowledge remains the same. So again, there are no null results in our paper that carry any value. 
And the way we're asking the question whether it's beneficial for society uh, to incentivize this novel research, we again make the simplest choice. So we let society costlessly choose a research question and the success probability in the first period. So now society maximizes its long run payoff and in each period it gets the value of the knowledge that we have in this period and it maximizes it only with respect to the first period question and success probability and after the first period all choices are made by the researchers individually. Then we can show a simple proposition that says that for a non-empty interval of cost parameters, the decision maker prefers a moonshot in the first period, so very novel distance in the first period, if its discount factor is large enough. So now the only interesting, the interesting thing here is that um, we have this interval of cost parameters. So the intuition here is that if the cost is very low, then researchers have only a small distortion relative to society. So they almost maximize then the same objective. So in that case, um, the, the short run losses of a suboptimal distance in the first period will dominate um, any potential long run gains, which are small in this case. And similarly, if the costs are very high, then the benefit of the moonshot is going to be small because no matter which moonshot you actually incentivize, researchers in the future will only find um, um, new answers with small probabilities because the cost is so high. This again means that the short run losses of a suboptimal distance will dominate the, the gains in the future. Okay. So now let me illustrate you why these um, moonshots can be beneficial and now in terms of the landscape that it creates over time. So we have the questions again on the horizontal axis and we look at three periods now only and the evolution without a moonshot. So in the first period, we only know the answer to question zero and now suppose society would dictate answering the myopically optimal question three key. Then in the second period, the new researcher will observe question zero, question three QR answered, has a particular cost parameter in this example, one over eight, and decides that in this case, it's optimal to uh, expand knowledge with a distance of 5.1. Researcher in period three arrives, observes question zero, three Q and 5.1 Q is answered, and then decides to expand knowledge again with question 7.2. Now, how can a moonshot be helpful? Now, suppose society would dictate answering question 6Q in this case. Now, what the researcher in period two does, it observes question zero and question 6Q being answered. And now we have a research area of intermediate length. So the researcher will jump into the middle of the research area and answer question 3Q. Then from the third period onwards, new researcher observes this landscape of knowledge and will expand knowledge with um, a distance of 2.1 Q. The point is now that the evolution on the right-hand side is better in terms of um, the value it generates than the left-hand side, because remember, society prefers research areas of length 3 Q over shorter research areas. And with this moonshot, it encouraged the researcher to kind of close this gap. So the benefit of a, of, um, of a moonshot here is that it creates research areas that will subsequently be filled up by future researchers. And now this was just in terms of benefits of the landscape that's going to be created. The moonshot also increases the success probability of research because we saw in the characterization of the researchers problem that um, the highest success probability of research occurs in intervals of intermediate length not when expanding knowledge. So moonshots um, incentivizing very distance re distant research um, are beneficial in terms of the, um, the, the landscape they generate and in terms of the success probability. Christoph, yes. I, I don't want to take your last minute. I was just sort of curious about somewhat different payoff functions. So when, for researchers, we care about whether we come up with an answer or not. Um, if you don't find an answer, you don't get published, you don't get 
your PhD, you don't get career advancement and so on. Uh, right. And so I was sort of curious about what the career effects would be in a model in under this sort of payoff function like this. Would we expect more timid uh, questions from PhD students versus early career faculty versus senior faculty? And sort of how might we think about overcoming that bias? That's... I think is is a very good question. So, so I mean, if I if I would come now from my perspective, I suppose I have very different incentives than a senior researcher. Um, and um, I would think that young researchers might rather care about uh, answering questions with a high probability to get something published, as you suggest. And um, and more senior researchers might care more about the impact uh, or the impact of their answers. So um, this would push, I guess, PhD students rather to, um, to, to less novelty, while seniors towards, um, towards more novelty and, and less success probabilities. Um, what you could do about this, well, create research areas for, for, for juniors where they can um, answer novel questions with a high probability would be the easy answer here. So incentivize moonshots of seniors to have uh, juniors fill up the gaps, but to fill up gaps that are still valuable. So not too narrow areas, but sufficiently um, distant or long research areas. Yeah. So that would be my takeaway on this one. But for this, I guess we would have to introduce more heterogeneity into the model, which I guess is, is very much feasible. The model is quite tractable and, and could potentially pre provide kind of interesting answers to questions like that. Okay, great. Now I'm slightly running out of time. So let me just briefly tell you what we do in the science funding application. So again, we keep the assumption of scientific freedom so that researchers can freely choose their research questions, but that there is a funder who has a budget K and has two instruments at hand that have a relative price. And the instruments are that the funder can either reduce the cost of research, so lower ETA, or award a price where the probability of obtaining the price zeta is increasing in the difficulty of the question. So it's increasing in the, in the imprecision of the conjecture. And the relative price kappa refers to the price of cost reduction relative to the price of prices. Now, the question we're asking here is which novelty and output combinations such a funder can incentivize and what we do then in the paper is we characterize the set of combinations of distance and success probability that this funder can actually induce. And one immediate takeaway is that if you want to encourage moonshots as a funder, you really need to use some sort of prices, so some monetary or, or, or utility um, reward for novel findings because cost reductions alone will never push you to very novel findings inside of RIN. Now I can show you examples of how these um, funding possibility set look like. And the reason we don't discuss much more here is that it all depends a lot on parameters, but importantly, also for a funder, the distance and the success probability can be, um, can be complements. So this possibility frontier can be upward sloping so that if you want to incentivize a higher degree of novelty, the researcher will at the same time also increase um, uh, the output. However, it may also turn out that there are substitutes and the funder has to solve this trade-off between output and novelty. And now this possibility set, you can just combine with the simple um, micro 101 tools of kind of constraint optimization and, and indifference curves. So we have this example where we look at the funder who maximizes the, the expected benefit, static benefit of expanding knowledge. And um, um, we can show that also in this case, again, output and novelty can be complements. And depending on whether they are complements or not, the funder might or might not incentivize excessive novelty. Okay, so here are the possibility sets for two examples um, together with the indifference curves uh, of, of the um, funding institution. And um, here cost reductions are cheap, so you can actually incentivize high degrees of output, 
So this makes uh, output and novel TV substitutes. Um, but if cost reductions are more expensive, you cannot incentivize such, such high um, output levels. This makes then um, the, uh, the two become complements. The reason is that um, if the highest possible output level is low, then again, if you think about the marginal benefit and the marginal cost of uh, increasing output, then you still have the, the positive effect of a higher distance, which pushes you to try to answer a question with a higher probability, and the marginal cost where a higher distance makes search more costly. Now, the two are weighted differently because the marginal cost effect is weighted by a convex function. This inverse error function of rho is convex, so that when rho is large, actually this marginal cost effect is very strong because you have this convex cost component. So therefore, for high levels of output, the two are um, um, substitutes from the funder's perspective, while for low levels of output, the two turn out to be complements because the marginal benefit, benefit outweighs the marginal cost effect. And I guess I should now wrap up. So just to, to briefly conclude is, what we did in this paper is we, we proposed a model of knowledge that kind of builds on three ingredients. There's a large pool of correlated questions and um, knowledge here informs conjectures about related questions and society uses this knowledge to, um, to uh, choose its policies. Inside this framework, we conceptualize research as the free choice of research question and the costly search for their answers and we show that actually there is this link between novelty and output, and that there is um, this. It's important to look at the existing knowledge when you think about uh, what researchers would do and how you can encourage researchers to do particular things. This model is quite tractable, and we believe you can apply it in many different contexts. So we've given you two examples here. The evolution of science, that there is this dynamic externality, because precisely because um, knowledge generation today affects the choices of researchers in the future, and that therefore moonshots can improve the evolution of knowledge. And then, which I went a little bit briefly over the uh, research incentives. So we've shown you how a fund, or what a funder with particular instruments at hand can actually implement. There's many more things you can do. You can think uh, quite nicely about null results in this framework because they affect the distribution of, of the answers, um, also of related answers. But this is something we don't have many results on yet. And um, that's it from my side. Thank you for, for bearing with me. Thanks. Um, so yeah, we are a bit over time, but uh, yeah, let's get the Q&A started. Maybe if the... Maybe let's start with the panelists if they have any uh, any last questions. Yeah. Let me jump in, Julia, since uh, uh, Steve already took away my what should young research and old researchers do, and I guess that was very much motivated, very much on my mind. I was thinking there more on like, okay, what is the best thing to do if you also have these incentives for getting tenure? But the question that I then, uh, you sort of start to answer in point four here is that, I, what is very much at the forefront of my mind is also thinking about what happens when there's competition uh, between researchers. So the you know, recent paper by Ryan Hill and Carolyn Stein, they emphasize very much that it is important to be first. Uh, and they emphasize that surely maybe we, you get a, a quantity quality trade-off. When you introduce competition here uh, or two researchers searching for an answer at the same time, do you also get predictions that maybe we do less novel research or we do more proceduralist research because that makes us be first or makes us more likely to get an answer? Uh, and Or is it just any form of conjecture that you have or what happens when you have some form of competition between researchers? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a very interesting point too. So... I mean, you would have to think about how to twist this model a little bit. So, so my naive first idea would be to introduce kind of a, say two researchers and it takes kind of a random time to find an answer. And now clearly if, if they work on very similar questions and someone comes first and you come a little bit later, then the benefit of your finding will be, will be lower than for the first researcher. 
So, so that's immediate. And then if you think of this random time, depending on the degree of novelty, right? So suppose you work on a very novel question, then maybe you expect that it takes more time to find the answer. Then you might want to try to answer um, less novel questions, right? Because it may be that someone in the meantime finds something between where you are searching and, uh, and the existing knowledge, which again lowers the value of your very novel finding because now it's not that novel anymore. So my conjecture on this would actually be that, that such a model would, would reduce the degree of novelty and, and importance of being first. If I can follow up. So it also makes me think about how we can, what are the norms of science and how we evaluate other junior faculty and PhD students. And one way that's often bandied around, which always annoys me, is citation counts. Uh, you know, citation counts contain some information, but not as much information as some people seem to think. And so I'm sort of curious as to whether we could, from this model, tease out a, a theory of citation counts, which papers get cited the most, and, and you know, is there a monotonic uh, evaluation of more cited papers? Um, you know, maybe you need something in, to enrich the model, but it seems like it has the structure where you know, an ambitious but not very smart researcher could insert themselves in a literature and get cited a lot uh, without really adding much value. And so can we get a relationship between citation count and, and the value you add to society from this framework? Well, that's, that's a very good question that I, I, I think I don't have a good answer to um, um, just immediately. Um, I mean, I believe you can, can think about different measures. I mean, if you think about citations from, from say policy, right? Then maybe if you, if you close a research area and so no one kind of works to the left and to the right of you anymore and society takes regular actions inside this area, you might be the, the one that gets cited there a lot, right? This would be one way. But then if you think about um, uh, scientific citations, I'm, I'm not sure I have a good idea right now what, what would be a, a, a relation of cit citations to the, the well, I question. think that last example you gave is a good example of the non-monotonicity. If I close off an area, I might be adding a lot of value to society, but no one in the scientific literature will cite me again because <laughs> the area has been closed off. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I've answered the question and so now everyone's moved on and I don't get cited, but I did I did add a lot of value. So I think that's an example of a non-monotonicity. Can, can I just then I'll add one more comment to change directions and, and add a, offer a, a possible application or interpretation of this payoff function. So this payoff function's got this very sharp, uh, well, there's a cutoff threshold. So can I think of this as a firm making a decision about which markets to enter or which products to offer? And they investigate, you know, I'm sitting here in the US and all of these points are different markets I could possibly enter around the world. And I'm investigating one of those markets and I learn the likely outcome of that market. And then the firm, if it's confident enough about the outcome, it enters a market. If it's not confident about a market, it, it doesn't enter that outcome. And so I can, can I think of this payoff function and this model is applying to, it's because it's very binary decision at the back here is this binary decision of society, whether to choose the status quo or pursue a, an area. Can I think of this as firm decision-making about whether to enter markets or not? Yeah, I mean, so I think, um, yes, that's, that's a nice interpretation for choosing between a proactive choice or that status quo choice. Um, I think the, the, the proactive choice would need a little bit more information. So I, I enter the market, but how do I enter the market, I guess, would be the question here. Do I enter it maybe, I don't know, with a, with a high price or a low price or, or what kind of price level or quality level of my product do I want to offer? But I mean, the binary choice, I guess that's a good interpretation of it. For the, for the precise proactive choice, um, I, I guess I would have to think a little bit more about what this would mean uh, in this context, yeah. Okay, great. Right, so I think we are already coming pretty close to the official end, so maybe I do the official 
uh, salutations, but um, uh, since we haven't really given uh, the attendees uh, the possibility to ask questions yet, um, please, uh, if you do have a question, just stick around and, uh, and uh, then you can just uh, uh, ask questions in the informal part of this. Um, but yeah, for now, um, we'll, we'll stop the recording and let me thank uh, Christoph for the great presentation and Johannes for the hard work in the chat and also uh, our two panelists, Florian and Steve, uh, for uh, the great questions. And uh, hopefully see you next week for uh, Chan uh, Ugo. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks.